uh, so they we are going to continue with uh, the uh, programming language concepts and talk uh, more about uh, type systems. Actually, uh, during the last chapters, we were all talking about type systems because we are talking about uh, abstraction and uh, especially in encapsulation, we refer to the data type much. Uh, so we are trying to create abstract data types, for example, in the encapsulation. So this is just a uh, uh, wrap up of all uh, things relevant to uh, data types. Uh, we actually uh, talk about uh, the uh, data types in programming languages in previous chapters from the earliest chapter. Uh, if you remember, we talk about static type checking versus dynamic type checking. And then we talk about uh, equals, name equals versus structural equals. Uh, and then we talk about the uh, binding, the declarations that create data types. Then we talk about abstraction and encapsulation. And uh, everything uh, combined, we end up in uh, a problem for programming language what is the data type and how type checking is done. Uh, structural equivalence and name equivalence uh, topic answered that question actually. And uh, however, there are some um, blurry points uh, up to this point because for example, uh, in C, you can assign an integer to a double variable. They are not name equals, and C uses name equals, but you can do this. So uh, this gives a hint about that. Uh, the type checking is not as strict as uh, it is defined mathematically. So programming languages uh, behave uh, flexible in some sense. So today we are going to talk about that flexibility mostly. Uh, so the uh, programming language has to answer uh, this question. Is it going to be monomorphic or polymorphic type system? And the monomorphism uh, value uh, or an entity in the programming language has to have uh, a strict data type. And it is final. And the polymorphic, it can change shape. So it can have different varieties uh, of types. The second question is overloading uh, is going to be allowed or not. So uh, if you are, uh, if you define the name already, are you going to redefine it or use it for another purpose? So uh, this is quite um, related to a binding problem as well. So in the binding problem, the scope, if you remember, we have the applied occurrence and the binding occurrence. And uh, same name is used in two binding occurrences or not is the overloading basically. And the next is uh, the flexibility of the type system. So uh, the programming language will make some assumptions about uh, your intent so that it can correct your uh, operation convert the data types automatically whenever it can. And it's called coercion. So today we are going to talk about this. And more importantly, we are going to talk about the type relations and subtypes. Um, this is important because it is going to open a window for us in the object-oriented programming. Uh, if two data types are relevant to each other, the type system can be uh, more flexible. And we are going to talk about that. And in the later uh, chapters in object-oriented programming, we will see that it brings us the inheritance, the mechanism uh, which is important in object-oriented programming. Uh, and then polymorphism is the basic issue in this chapter. Uh, so in monomorphism, monomorphism, we have a final uh, data type for all of the functions, all of the variables, uh, so that they don't change. So a variable is fixed at compile time with uh, a data type assigned to it, and it remains same. And uh, only uh, types compatible to that uh, 
data type of the entity is applied on them. Uh, however, in the polymorphism, our type system allows uh, different data types work in the same function, for example. A function that is capable of handling multiple different data types. So the data type of the function is not uh, fixed at all. Uh, same for declarations, classes, and so on. Uh, for variable, it is more tricky. So variable actually uh, either overwritten by a new data type or not. So you don't have that flexibility. But for the rest, the functions and declarations, you can provide some sort of um, flexibility so that, or generalism, let us say. Uh, so function behaves as a general function that's capable of doing multiple things. And this is called polymorphism. Uh, overloading uh, can be considered as a part of uh, polymorphism, but actually it is not, so we call that ad hoc polymorphism. Uh, the idea is the polymorphism is handled in the binding level. So during the binding operation, the same name is you use more than one time. So you, use, you define a sort function for integers, a sort function for doubles, a sort function for uh, special kind of structures and uh, the language guesses which is which, and that's it. So it is not like uh, polymorphism. In actual polymorphism, you should have a single function, single body behaving differently based on data type. Uh, not behaving differently, but uniformly depending on different data types. The second is called inclusion polymorphism. It is like natural by mathematical definition of data type. If there is a subtype relation uh, between two data types, uh, either they are uh, subclasses uh, in the sense that a subset uh, relation, uh, like an integer subset uh, or a mathematical set kind of subset, uh, or it can be a subclass relation so that the subclass has everything in the superclass, but some details. So everything in the superclass, all functions working on the superclass is supposed to work in the subclass as well. And it is called inclusion polymorphism. The last one is parametric polymorphism, which is the most powerful one. So the idea is as long as you have a matching general pattern of the data type, the function can operate on all of the data type. So we are going, or we are observing this parametric polymorphism, especially in Haskell and languages like that. In object-oriented programming, the generics or templates works in a similar way. So now let us uh, define a couple of things uh, first. One is subtyping. In the subtyping, we have actually a subset relation between the uh, data types, like it is in C. So in C, you can basically uh, say that uh, the character is a subset of short and short is a subset of integer and integer is a subset of long. Uh, so do we have to define a different multiplication for all of them, each of them? And the answer is no, because the it, uh, addition is the same thing, uh, only concern here is uh, the uh, boundaries of those data types. So we will have overflows eventually. So if you multiply 100 by 100, it will not fit into car. Uh, or it, if you multiply 10,000 by 10,000, it will not fit in 16-bit uh, integer short. So uh, we don't have to implement all of them separately. We can have a single implementation capable of uh, handling all of them. And the solution can be uh, defined by programming language in different ways, like in C, uh, they are converted into some base data type and converted back. Uh, or it can be implemented in some language level. So the programming language will decide on the data types and based on that it will uh, decide on the precision or the uh, 
size of your or cardinality of your uh, data type. So mathematically, we can define it like that. If we have such a function, and if u is subset of t, that function is supposed to work, or you can expect it to work on u to v as well. Uh, common example is the arithmetic operations, but there can be other uh, variations of this as well. Okay. So here, uh, instead of a subset relation, we can also define another relation, which we are going to call inheritance. Uh, inheritance is related to information content of the data type. And uh, when you have a data type, which contains all of the information in one other data type, but adds something, like in this example, uh, we have point, it has some basic information, the coordinates of the point. Uh, the circle has all information of a point. However, in addition, it has this R. And square has all basic information of a point. In addition, it contains this A. And a rectangle has all basic information of a point. It, in addition, it has this width and height information. So basically, we can say that circle inherits point, square inherits point, and rectangle inherits point. Basically, they are shapes and their uh, basic coordinates, center of a circle or uh, the corner, upper left corner of a square or rectangle is a point, basically. So you can uh, call them different ways. You can say a circle is a point with radius. A square is a point with width, width information. A rectangle is a point with width and height information. So uh, you can have different things for them. For example, uh, a point is less informative to others are more informative. And uh, another uh, typical naming is you can call some of them like you can say circle extends point, or you can say circle uh, is sub class of or sub class of points, or in the other way, you can say point is super class of circle. So you can uh, name in different ways, but the idea is the same. Uh, the less informative to more informative, we can uh, carry uh, some of the information. Uh, okay. okay. So, uh, we are going to continue with this and how we can have a type system getting flexible about that. The idea is this, if I write an operation which is capable of manipulating the points, do I have to repeat it for all of the other shapes? Like this point here, this move here, move function here, as getting a point, uh, it is returning a new point with this new x and y coordinates. So it will be uh, like updating the point with new x and new y values. So it is basically moving the point somewhere else. Moving a circle, moving a square, moving a rectangle is not different than that. So my idea is if you can move a point, you can move a circle, square, or a rectangle the same way, updating x and y, that's it. Width and height does not change, radius does not change, and the A uh, value does not change for the square. So we can denote that uh, in this way, but the uh, X, Y is a shape, 
point is a shape with no other information. Circle is a shape, square is a shape, rectangle is a shape. So they uh, are inherited from the shape interface or shape class. Uh, and we can define hypothetically or in real life programming languages respecting that. Um, this is a hypothetical example. Uh, this code only works for a very special uh, dialect of uh, Haskell Hugs with 98 versions open. Uh, so this is a Haskell uh, structure, rectangle, X and Y coordinates, and circle, square, rectangle. So in this dialect, in this specific dialect, I can do this. I can have a move function uh, which contains a rectangle uh, or a structure with X and Y. I believe that should be a rec here, but the idea is, and there are rest, the remaining members. And then it's going to return uh, new X and new Y values from B and C, and the rest is copied. Rest can be empty or it can contain radius with height, whatever your rectangle is. So here you can define your shape, circle, square, rectangle, and then you can move B, move C, move D in any way you like. So you write a move function and it's capable of handling multiple structures. So this is the closest example that we can do with uh, Haskell. Uh, but in object-oriented programming languages, it is much more convenient because it is a natural part of that. We will uh, spend some more time in the object-oriented programming chapters of the course. Uh, now let us uh, more talk about the Haskell classes. Uh, if you are a little bit familiar with object-oriented programming, uh, you will be confused with Haskell term classes. Because in Haskell, uh, the uh, class is not an uh, object type. Uh, in Haskell, class is a type class. So uh, assume you have different types, like real values, 32-bit integer, 64-bit integer, etc., And they belong to the same uh, type class. They behave different. Uh, in a, a similar way. So the, the Haskell's idea of classing is they created a type hierarchy of uh, type classes so that uh, if you uh, like your data type to be part of this tree or hierarchy, you just implement a couple of functions, then uh, your code will behave in a similar way to the others. So for example, in Haskell, we have numbers. Number is a class, a type class in Haskell. If you have some sort of algebraic data type which are added, multiplied, and so on, you can make it a number. Uh, so it will work like this. Uh, this is the uh, summary of uh, type classes in Haskell. Uh, so we have uh, some classes are alone here, like this, read and show. For example, if you're if you like your data type to be printable on screen, you implement it uh, as an instance of show class so that you will have your data type converted into string provided by you. And it will be like a, a member of the family of showable data types. Each class has a couple of interfaces to be implemented. For example, if you like equal EQ class, you need to implement equal and not equal. If you implement not equal, uh, implement equal, not equal can be the, just the negation of that. If you like it to be ordered, you implement those interfaces. If you like it to be a member of number, you implement those uh, seven functions. If you like to be real, you implement the rational. Uh, the fractional, you have to implement the uh, division and from rational and so on. And it goes like that, enumerated integral, 
integral we have extra remainder division uh, modular operations and uh, in the floating class we have trigonometric functions and so on and where I variations of that and show is simply just show which gets your data type and converts uh, it to a string. Now let us uh, do an exercise on that. Actually I have provided uh, I have already implemented this for you, but let us implement it together. Uh, uh, this is our rational data type uh, we talked uh, in the previous hours. Uh, so basically it adds subtracts and so on, but it is uh, a lonely data type. Uh, for example, you have to use your own uh, functions, function names. Mm -hmm. so I import it this way and So oh. the idea here is you can use it this way, like that. However, if you like to use this way, you have to make it, uh, you have to implement this plus operator. But you single-minded to directly implement the uh, plus operator, it will give you an error because plus operator belongs to some specific data class which is numbers, okay? So you have to make it a member of number here, okay? Uh, so operator overloading doesn't work for Oscar. You have to make it uh, a part of the subclass if you like to uh, use exactly the same operator. So let us do, at least try to do on our own, what is my syntax? My syntax is, I have to declare this. I want to make uh, my new data type, rational rat, So that I can use this addition, subtraction, and multiplication. So I put my definitions here so that instead of add, subtract, and multiply, now I can use So this is going to make my uh, addition, subtraction, multiplication as a member of num class. So I will have num class working at some extent. Sorry, uh, we have to use the data type, not the constructor. Okay. So I have to clean this as well. Uh, if you use this in fixed operators alone, we are going to expect uh, left-hand side and right-hand side arguments, so I have to take them within the parentheses. So now, it has some complaints, but uh, it's some sort of word. So that the, what is the advantage? The advantage of such a thing is, uh, 
if you have a general operator, like for example, sum, which gets basically a list and a, a num class data type, and it will give you the num class data type. So that means if you say, if you try to get some of those values, it will give you 26. Uh, thanks to making a rational a part of some Now I'm going to get an error, okay. So, so I, it is expecting from integer in order to get me a zero. So let us give it to that. So, from integer gets an integer value i and composes a rational value out of it. So i over one will give you this uh, rational number, okay? It will convert it into integers. So I had the syntax error. the moment. Okay, so the top and space uh, problem is causing this. So if you use spaces, you have to be consistent and if you use top, it is going to complain. Now this from integer is implemented and, and you ask this question, it will give you some of all of them. Or product, you will get it. So in this way, it, you made your data type a part of the standard Haskell uh, numbers or uh, all functions that can manipulate numbers can manipulate your uh, data type as well. And this is the uh, basic advantage of that. Uh, so the, in order to have a better or full example, I actually implemented the full uh, couple of classes here. So in order to make it EQ, I implemented this so that comparison will work. Uh, not comparison, but equal to test will work. Uh, if you implement this less than or less and less than or equal to, uh, the order uh, will work. So for example, you can have uh, sorting or sort related uh, operations will be possible. This is numbers with the absolute value and uh, signal function. And in order to implement the white, you have to implement this uh, fractional. So now, uh, now you can, if you implement this, uh, besides this uh, small complaint, now you can have, for example, in addition to those, you will have minimum or maximum. These are all uh, built-in functions of Haskell. I didn't implement them. Uh, thanks to making my uh, class uh, instance of uh, numbers, uh, now it works. Also, it will work with division now as well. So, division will work as well. As the last touch, we can implement a common. Class instance, 
which is show. In order to do that, you have to implement show function of like this. So you can basically uh, implement it as, for example, show x. So you should return a string here. Now implementing this will conflict about this deriving show we were using until the moment. We are going to get rid of this show here, deriving show here. So now, thanks to this, now your data will be shown like this, okay? And This is the idea of uh, subclassing in Haskell, and I have uh, further examples of that, but let us first go back to our slides. Uh, okay. Uh, now, uh, I have another example. We, are, we can talk more about this example in an interactive session, if you like. So I, what I did is, uh, I have a data structure and a data structure is uh, capable of doing uh, data structure operations. But this is a uh, Haskell class. So everything that implement insert, get, and is empty is a data structure for me. And I don't care what they really do. What I care is I care those functions to be implemented and that's it. Uh, so when you write a data structure like stack or queue, what you need to do is implement insertion in stack case to be push, for example, get, which will be pop in the queue, uh, nq and dq operations, uh, and some empty test. Then now, uh, when you have such a data structure, all functions that are capable of using data structures can use this. And this is the uh, heart of uh, polymorphism in uh, object oriented programming languages. This notion available in Haskell, exactly available in Java as interfaces, in C as uh, the abstract classes. So basically, this is Java interface for abstract classes of C++, basically, okay? So uh, I'm going to go quick on this just to show you. Uh, my implementation. So this is my Okay, this inherit HS. So this is the early example. So this is going to give you an idea of how to define your own classes. Uh, so far we have created instances of existing classes. Now we are creating our own classes and my own class type class is data structure. And in the class body, only thing I need to do is uh, declare my interface. And my interface is this one. If V is ordered, given AV, A of V, and a V, it is going to return A and V. So it is going to just insert that value and return the new data structure. For get, it is going to uh, get one value out of an existing data structure. Maybe it is going to return the value and the remaining uh, data structure or not. And is empty is simply a Boolean value, true or false. So stack can be implemented very uh, basic way. 
insert will be push, get will be pop, is empty is empty test, and Q will be like that. Uh, NQ, the Q, and so on. Uh, if you are interested in their, their implementations argument here, the stack is something like this, push and pop. So basically it is a list you push to the beginning and end. For Q it is uh, appending at the end and getting from the head. Uh, this is not the uh, fastest uh, Q implementation. There are uh, wiser solutions, but it uh, helps the idea. And also I implemented this heap, which is a tree implementation of a heap data structure. Uh, so the heap data structure, if you remember, all, always have the root element as the uh, minimum element, uh, so that it will keep uh, always minimum element at the top. So when you uh, get it, you will always get the minimum element, and when you uh, push it, it will be uh, inserted in logarithmic time in the uh, depths of the tree. Pop it and insert uh, pop heap and insert heap are the functions and. I did the same thing. I made it a data structure. So that now all of them are data structures for me. So now, uh, so empty will be an empty stack. So when you, for example, insert empty value four, it will be like that. It will go like that. And same thing, if you do this for Q, you will end up in this. Uh, The, the Q version, this is the stack version, and this is the heap version, so it will be a heap tree. Um, the, uh, so you can do it, okay, but what is the advantage of that? The advantage is, once you define this, for example, a list inserter, which inserts a list of elements to is going to insert to the stack, it is going to insert to the queue, and it is going to insert to the heap. And thanks to this, now I have defined a polymorphic function, uh, which is capable of handling uh, different data types, stack, queue, and Heap. So uh, for Haskell, it may not be much interesting, but uh, this idea will be very interesting for us in the object-oriented program. Again, this is uh, the, one of the essential points of polymorphism in object-oriented programming. And you can do same thing in C++ and Java. You can create such an interface and you uh, inherit from that interface, implement those functions so that whoever using those functions can deal with your new data type without knowing the details of your data type. So uh, this is the type classes uh, of Haskell and this is the class hierarchy. The same example is on, on the slides as well. And the next thing we are going to talk about is the polymetric polymorphism, which you are ex experiencing in Haskell uh, from the first week of this classes. But the, uh, let us uh, put the name of it. It is called polymorphism, uh, parametric polymorphism. If you have a single function, that function is capable of doing uh, same thing on different data types. 
Uh, and uh, a typical example is identity. Whatever your values, it will return itself. So identity of four is four. Identity of a string is that string. Is, and structure, structure tuple is tuple. Simply, uh, basically the same thing. You are returning the same thing. And the, this polymorphism uh, is not available in C, for example. But in script languages and function languages, we observe that. Um, more generally, uh, Haskell can also do type checking, strict type checking with polymorphism as well, like our compose function. You give two functions, beta to gamma, alpha to beta, and it will get an alpha and return you a gamma. So comp compose square double will give you some compose. This some reverse will give you something else. Uh, the key point in parametric polymorphism is there are no instances of the same function. There is only one function, and that function uniformly executes the same thing on all of the uh, elements. This is also true for our insert list here. This insert list does the same thing on all of the uh, elements, but different data types. Okay. Uh, so we have uh, other examples here. And if you uh, notice the type signatures of such data types contain those alphas. In Haskell output, it will be like uh, T, like variable names. So the data type definitions containing these variables, which we call polytypes or uh, type variables, sorry, are called polytypes. Uh, so function languages have this property and they manage to keep uh, strict type checking together with that. Uh, in script languages, they uh, raise runtime errors without giving compile time checks. Uh, so this uh, type of uh, Polymorphism is very uh, valuable because you can uh, uh, generate a family of functions with, which are capable of uh, working on family of different data types. Uh, in C++ and Java, on the other hand, the situation is uh, slightly different. Uh, we have, um, In addition to this interfaces and polymorphism through inheritance, we have uh, generic abstractions. In C++, they are called templates, and in Java, it's called generics. They provide this polymorphism uh, in the compilation uh, through uh, the type variables that are in the form like this. So this is basically like a type variable. And this sort function here, gets a list of t and sort that. That means it is capable of sorting any uh, type of uh, trees, so, sorry, list uh, arrays. Uh, the uh, approaches of C++ and Java are different in that, uh, in implementation of generics, uh, but we are going to talk about that in object-oriented programming parts. So, in C++, it is about compile time. Uh, it depends on compile time binding. In Java generic, it is uh, based on this uh, virtual methods and uh, polymorphism through inheritance. Uh, so then our next topic is overloading. Uh, overloading is not uh, something too important for programming languages. Most of the programming languages uh, on purpose uh, do not implement overloading at all. Uh, some of them only uh, allows for operator overloading, nothing else, uh, like Python. Uh, and with objects, uh, some of them just uh, avoid them completely. In C++, we can do this. 
the idea is this one. Uh, there are two functions, and uh, but their name are similar. A name are the same. So it is uh, two Ahmeds. They are two different persons completely. But when you are calling Ahmed, you know which one to call by looking at some hint. Uh, and the compiler exactly does that. So if you uh, look into this example, I have uh, created a complex structure. And then I define the multiplication of two double values. And I have defined complex to complex multiplication. And uh, I have used here multiplication of A and B and multiplication of Y and 2.1. So the idea is simply an overloading idea is actually binding. This one will be bound to this, and this one will be bound to this function. And compile, uh, compiler is capable of doing that distinction. And the uh, overloading is implemented. Uh, we have an option here. Uh, the hint of choosing the correct overloading, the correct, correct binding, comes from actually parameters. But uh, depending on what you are going to do, what you are, what part of the type, data type you are going to look at, uh, makes a uh, distinction. So uh, this is a function, name is from parameters to result. If you look into complete picture, it is called context dependent overloading because you are looking at uh, the context. And uh, the other one is only looking at this part. Basically, it is looking at the parameter zone. And it's called context independent overloading. Uh, the both are uh, options, and let us see how difficult to implement either of them. So, this is my example. I have uh, versions of F, which is a hypothetical example. I'm going to talk about that in a moment in C. Uh, you can do that with some error. Uh, I'm going to talk about the, the reason in a moment. So the idea here is I have three functions of f, their same name, uh, three functions called f, and we are going to try to determine which one is which. Here, if you look into this, a is integer, x is Double. So we are looking for double to integer. And this one is our candidate. So I can call this a one. Okay. So it is easy. So double to integer. Uh, so I uh, just did look at the context, but I didn't have to in this example because. There is only one f with double parameter. So it is obvious so this one. And the second one, I have a is integer. But there are two integer parameter f's. So the candles are two and three. In order to distinct between, distinguish between two and three, I have to look into what it returns. The return values is assign, assigned to an integer here. So it should be integer to integer. That's why I am making this a uh, two. And this one, from the same reason, uh, three, because it is integer to double. That's how I can make the distinction. And I am looking at the context. Return value is used in which context? In the assignment to integer versus assignment to double. Uh, it's getting more complicated. Here, I have an operator, a uh, floating point value is assigned to a floating point value plus fa. a is integer, so integer to what I am going to choose. The context is actually a floating point addition, double to double addition, so the context is double. That's why I am going to use, again, I'm going to vote for three. 
context is double. The next one is getting more complicated. Uh, I have a double here, inner one, and the outer one I don't know. So let us look into this. The inner one is a double to something, and that something is a parameter to f, uh, which is returning an integer. So now let us look into this internal one, inner one. In the inner one, x is double, so I have only one candidate. So I can say that it is basically, so I can reduce that. The inner one is a one, okay? So inner one is f1. But what about the outer one? The inner one returns an integer, and that integer is used by the outer one to return what? Another integer. So the outer one is integer to integer. And by looking at the context, I can say that it is f2, OK? So it says f2 of f1 of x. So it's easy and there is no ambiguity. But the last one is the most uh, problematic one. In that one, I have the inner one has two options. It gets an integer. So the inner one can be f2 x or f x. If it is uh, f2x, if it is f2x, it is going to return an integer. The inner one is going to return an integer. And that integer is going to be assigned to an integer. So I can say that f2 fx is a solution. The other one, f3, returns a double. So I'm looking for a double two integers, and I have a one such function. I have one such function, which is f1. So now I have a bigger question, which is which one? And this is called ambiguity. Uh, so if a programming language has to choose among legitimate alternatives, it is an ambiguity. And we don't like ambiguity in programming languages because the only thing we can do is ask users, which one do you like? And the interactive compilation is not a good thing. So in most of the cases, such ambiguous uh, cases, programming language will give you an error the compilation error so that you will choose the correct one. So this type of overloading is actually have problems. So these are the alternatives. So what we need to do is we need to get rid of that ambiguity. Uh, by the way, so far we didn't talk about type conversion at all. So there is no type conversion here. And still, the problem is that complicated. Uh, so this brings us uh, the conclusion that context-dependent overloading is expensive. And it follows what, uh, the, the, there is a follow-up question, philosophical question, philosophical question. Does it work? Isn't, is it useful at all? Because if a compiler uh, is confused, the programmer will confuse too. So a compiler can deal with more complexity than a human being. So uh, this confusion will end up in programming mistakes and so on. Uh, so uh, that's why most of the overloading languages just avoid context-dependent uh, overloading. So, so they follow context-independent overloading. 
Uh, so context independent overloading for this is two and three being together. So it relies only on the parameter set. So parameter sets have, have, have to be uh, unique in the uh, program. So uh, this is uh, the conclusion in C++. It's simply, simply context independent, so you cannot use uh, parameter sets being same for uh, same name functions. Uh, overloading is useful when you are doing same operation on different data types. Uh, the same operation meaning semantically same, like adding, for example, multiplying, and so on. You are multiplying doubles of some precision and double, uh, doubles of complex values. So you can use multiply, such a name. Uh, and you can take advantage of overloading for ease of uh, reading. But uh, if you use, for example, multiply for duplicating something in some function, and in the other one you are using for mathematical multiplication, you are getting your programmers confused. That's it. There is no other ad advantage. So just use duplicate and multiply. Use different things. Uh, and that's it uh, about overloading. It is much. Uh, it is not much uh, productive, so they just avoid it. In most languages, like for example, Python, uh, doesn't let you overload function function names, but operators can be overloaded by some um, method overloading. Uh, the rest is not possible. The next thing is, is variable overloading puzzle. This is just a, a puzzle for you. Uh, if you like, you can think about that. I am not going to answer that. Is variable overloading possible or not? And in which conditions it, uh, it is possible? If you like to discuss, you can open it on uh, our forum, ask the question more, and you can share your ideas. The coercion is uh, automated uh, type conversion uh, of the language, and you are familiar with that, I believe, from C programming language. Most of the examples here are from C. So here I have integer and variable. So what C does is, if it is going to have an arithmetic operation between an integer and double, it is trying to type uh, cast it to the uh, more precision data type. So it is going to typecast K into a double. So we will have an invisible double conversion here. And in that case, it is going to make the double arithmetic, but the result is going to be assigned to an integer variable. So it will make an integer conversion at the end, uh, which is by the way, uh, dangerous because you, will, you are going to lose uh, the fractional parts. If, if you are uh, aware of that, it's okay, but uh, the readers of your program will not be aware of that in most of the cases. So explicit uh, type conversion is um, preferred in such cases. And this one is getting this two to double and it is assigned to x and so you will end up in a double value. However, that double value is converted back to integer. So we, we have uh, also an integer conversion here before that, okay? So we have an integer conversion uh, just before the assignment. And the last one, we have similar k is converted into double, 2 is converted into double, k is converted into double, and the result is converted to integer. Uh, so sometimes it is uh, preferred, but sometimes it is not good. There are other uh, types of conversions, like uh, pointer conversions, uh, coercions. So for example, in C, all pointers are converted to void pointer for ease of uh, flexibility uh, and the void to other one is sometimes explicit. Sometimes you will get an uh, error. 
there are different uh, interesting uh, conversions, like for example, pointer to itself or itself to pointer. Sometimes looks useful, but however, as I said, conversion is sometimes dangerous. If you are aware of what you are doing, and if you can memorize what you had done like 10 months ago uh, with coercion, you can remember that it's very hard in uh, quotes larger than thousands lines. Uh, so it's okay, but in most of the cases you are going to forget after a couple of months what you had done in your quotes. So it's a good thing to use this explicit coercion instead of uh, implicit ones. Uh, and if it is combined with overloading, it will get much more complex. Uh, complex. Uh, and neural language is just quick coercion. So whatever what you like to do is you have to explicitly tell. Like in Haskell, for example, you have to convert your data type before assigning between them. Uh, so the next idea I would like to talk about is type inference. Uh, in some languages, user has to declare data types explicitly one by one. This is a function getting integer and returning a double. You have to do that explicitly. Uh, in some languages, like Haskell on the other hand, the language is smart to infer it itself. Because you are doing an operation, you are declaring a variable and declaring a function getting that variable and so on. By looking at them, infer the data types. And uh, what Haskell tries to do is combine it with polymorphism so that it will try to infer the most general data type uh, uh, possibly having some type variables inside and then you just use it. Uh, so by using the uh, information in the uh, declaration of a function, for example, the body of the function, you can uh, infer the data type of the function. For example, if you are using some sort of assignment or equality, you say that those data types, the data type of X and data type of uh, Y should be equal. This is a constraint. So you start with the uh, most general data type and you put those constraints to narrow it down into a more specific one. Uh, if you use, for example, any uh, operators or functions, by looking at uh, the existing data types, you know about those functions, you can uh, infer uh, the parameter data type and return data type. Uh, for example, plus, forces the arguments to be under num class. So it will say that A is a num class, whatever F returns is a num class, okay? Function application is the same with operators. So we have parameter and return value. E should be return type of F and it should be input type of F and it goes like that. Similar type constructors and so on. And if all of them are combined with some uh, number of uh, iterations probably. Uh, we have some dependency graph among the type data types and by solving this uh, equation, actually it's a type equation ending up, we can tell uh, the most general data type satisfying the constraints. And this is what Haskell is doing. And if you uh, like, you can explicitly give it this two uh, colors. Uh, in, uh, non-functional languages like uh, C++, uh, C++, C, etc. We can use uh, the initializers and, uh, sorry, this should be, okay, okay. Uh, the uh, auto keyword in C++ 11, I will to C++ 3 and later. Uh, it's give us this type inference in this compiled language. It is called some sort of compiled time, uh, type inference. And it is not something difficult as it is in Haskell because in Haskell we have polymorphism in C++ we don't have that. But uh, simply uh, C++ can do this. And the type checking it is doing uh, the type uh, compatibility anyway. And when you have an initializer like that, 
uh, examples like that, for example. F3, whatever F3 returns is assigned to T. So T should be of the same data type here. Okay, it is auto. So how I am going to infer that? Uh, I am going to infer that by looking at return, of course. This is my clue here. Integer divided by double is a double. So that's, I'm going to call this as a double. So this will make this one double. And thanks to that, this one is going to be double as well. Okay. Uh, the second hint here uh, we can use is this initializer. Okay, so here I have a struct P, and what I do is the value is converted into struct B. So this data type of this right hand side is struct B. So that's why this auto should be uh, struct P. Okay, from the right hand side of the initialization, I can infer the auto. Uh, another mechanism is declaration type without initializing, without returning value, still you can do this. Uh, you provide a syntax here, like this. This one. So whatever PPTR X data type is, substituted here thanks to this declaration type. It's like a macro, like a size of type of that so on. And it works. Uh, so basically in type checking, compiler is doing that. It is just propagating the information with flexibility. It's sometimes uh, useful. In GCC, and I believe it is only GCC, we have type of, uh, in other di dialects, we also have correspondence like Microsoft C and so on. We can find similar. We can use the same uh, similar behavior of declaration type uh, as well. Okay, so this is, all I want to talk about the type system, and today we will talk about these issues, polymorphism, uh, polymorphism through subtyping, inheritance, and ad hoc polymorphism, which is overloading, parametric polymorphism, type classes of Haskell, uh, and creating instances of type classes, coercion and type inference. Thank you very much uh, for watching. See you in another class.